Oh no no that's that is the uh, that's a basketball thing right so it's not. All right, so uh, I think we should get started. So everyone, if you, if you could uh, take your seats, bring all the pizza that you can eat uh, to your seats. Um, <clears throat> I guess we are ready to start. So uh, welcome to the afternoon, uh, the lunch session of the AstroStat Day. Uh, so this session is actually the SolarStat lunch and uh, uh, we're going to have two talks about uh, that deal with uh, solar data. And as you might know, uh, solar physics, uh, solar, uh, physics uh, people were the ones who have been encountering this problem of big data in astronomy for the longest time. And I guess we'll find out how they have been dealing with it. Um, so uh, we have two uh, speakers, uh, Kathy Reeves, uh, who will go first, uh, followed by Trey Winter. Um, they're both uh, from the uh, solar, uh, what is the name of your? Uh, <laughs> the, the increasingly and accurately named solar and stellar x-ray group. We've been wandering into the infrared, so, you know, never mind. But. <laughs> uh, and uh, so uh, Kathy will start. She will uh, talk about the statistical properties of solar filament eruptions. So. Yes, Kathy. thank you. And, and there are no x-rays in this talk, so sorry to the high energy people. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to talk about uh, statistical properties of solar filament eruptions. Um, these are my collaborators, including a couple of solar RU students, which are noted with stars. OK, in case you're not look used to looking at resolved stars, this is the sun. Um, and I'm going to be talking about filaments, which are these dark things here. This is an H alpha image of the sun. Uh, filaments are dark um, in H alpha because they're absorbing. They're bundles of cool gas suspended in the atmosphere. Uh, you also see, it's a little hard to see on the screen, but there's a bright guy out here called a prominence. That is also a filament. It's just a filament that's rotated to the limb, and now you see it in emission instead of absorption. So I'll probably use these two terms um, interchangeably. So this is a model of what a filament is. Uh, it's cool material suspended in concave upward dips of a twisted magnetic field. So these colored lines here are the magnetic field, and then the blue color, solid color is where there are dips in the magnetic field where you might expect to find a prominence. This is from a model by Yingna Su. So you can find these filaments in, in all sorts of environments on the sun. Um, you can find them in active regions. This is a 171 angstrom and a 304 angstrom image of the same active region. There's this dark filament in here. You can find them in what we're going to call intermediate areas, which are kind of in the active region built, but not really inside an active region. You can find them in the quiet sun. Um, and you can find them near the poles of the sun, which we call polar crown filaments. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about mechanisms for the eruptions of these things, just because that'll be important to interpreting the statistical data later. Help! There we go. Um, so uh, the filament essentially is a bundle of magnetic field, and this is a model showing the, the eruption. This is actually a, a CME model. Um, and one of the important factors is the overlying uh, magnetic field and how fast it falls off. If the forces are out of balance on this bundle of magnetic field, it's going to erupt. If the forces are in balance, it'll stay where it is. Um, so one parameter that's used to uh, talk about this is called the uh, decay index, which is just the uh, uh, number that denotes how fast the magnetic field is falling off above this erupting flux rope. Um, critical value for an eruption is something like n equals 1 or 2, uh, depending on the solar conditions and the structure that's erupting. So uh, these eruptions can be caused by MHD instabilities. You have something like a kink instability, where there's a kink in this magnetic flux bundle, and the kink serves to become more kinked, and it just drives itself off. You also have a torus instability, um, where if you have a loop of uh, 
current, essentially, it wants to blow itself apart. Um, toroidal current wants to blow itself apart. So these are two MHD instabilities. Um, the kink instability tends to have a faster speed. The torus instability has a larger critical decay index. You can also have external triggers. Um, for example, you could have mass draining. Um, if all your forces are in balance, including gravity, and you lose some mass out of this prominence or filament, um, then your forces could become out of balance and the thing could erupt. Um, emerging flux can change the overlying field so that the, the strapping field of the overlying um, field is not holding the prominence down anymore. You can also have the same problem with flux cancellation where the flux cancels and uh, destabilizes the field. Okay, so that's your very fast summary of, of triggers. Um, the data sources I'm going to use in this talk um, are H-alpha data from the Big Bear Solar Observatory and Kenzel Hoei Solar Observatory. Um, these are part of the global H-alpha network. And then uh, extreme ultraviolet data from the Atmospheric Imaging Assembly on Solar Dynamics Observatory. Um, Vinay kind of alluded to this, but this telescope here is taking to, uh, it's taking 4K by 4K images, it takes eight of them every 12 seconds. So this is a lot of data. This is a terabyte and a half of data a day. Um, so we're also going to use some metadata sources. Uh, there's a database called the Heliophysics Event Knowledge Base. Um, the idea here is that all of the data is processed through uh, feature finding modules, which look for things like flares, filaments, coronal holes, um, all kinds of solar features, and tags them with metadata. And that metadata is very useful for doing statistical studies. Um, another metadata source we're going to use is based on the, the HEK. Um, this is our filament eruption catalog that we developed here at CFA. Uh, Ying Nasu and Patrick McCauley did this. Uh, with help from a lot of other people. There's almost a thousand filament eruptions in here. Um, these were pulled from the HEK and then added, we added a whole bunch of other bits of metadata um, to the, the filament um, eruption catalog. Things like twist, writhe, uh, symmetry. I'll talk about some of that stuff in a little bit. So the, the first topic I'm going to talk about is uh, kinematics of filament eruptions, uh, mostly done by Patrick McCauley, and the bits I'm going to talk about were also uh, part of Caitlin Evans' summer REU project. So um, for eruptions at the limb of the sun, you can build up a, a profile of how the eruption happens. Um, you can do that by taking a slice and watching the eruption as it happens. And you usually get a profile that looks kind of like this, where you have a slow onset and then a fast velocity as the eruption finally happens. Um, and I don't know why that happened. There we go. Uh, and so those are the uh, parameters that, that we're using to catalog uh, where, you know, where this height happens, what the slow rise speed is what the fast rise speed, those are some of the parameters that were cataloged in the, the kinematic study. So um, here's just one of our results, and I don't have any really sophisticated statistical methods in here, so maybe the astrostats people can help me with that. Um, but uh, in general, the onset height of the fast rise phase, so when the filament really starts taking off, increases with latitude. So this is latitude on the bottom, and we have a few different measures of the onset height. This is the initial height of the filament um, above the limb. This is the onset height of the uh, fast rise phase, and then um, we also normalized it. And you can see there's a fairly clear trend that the, towards the poles, higher in latitude, you get higher onset heights. There's also a connection with CMEs. Um, where uh, filament eruptions uh, typically have correlated CMEs, about 75% of the ones that we looked at. Um, this is a filament eruption, uh, probably also a CME, although I, to be honest, didn't check. Um, but 75% of the, the filaments, filament eruptions in the catalog have an associated CME. And uh, this, these are the um, cumulative probability distributions 
of the CME speeds for those four different categories I was talking about, polar crown, quiet sun, intermediate, and active region. Um, the polar crown tend to be slower. Uh, the intermediate and active region tend to be faster. And here's a really nice uh, visualization of those last two points. Um, this is the sun. And um, each one of these tracks represents one of the filament eruptions that we saw at the limb. And the little star denotes the height of the onset of the fast rise phase. So you can see that the ones here, the stars are higher. And the ones towards the equator, the stars are lower. And then the color is speed um, in the field of view of AIA. And again, you can see that the ones near the poles have typically slower speeds and the ones near the equator have higher speeds. Uh, another thing that um, we looked at in this paper was the decay index. Remember, the decay index is a measure of how fast the magnetic field is falling off as a function of height. And so um, we wanted to see if it, the uh, filaments in these locations had any difference based on the uh, decay index. So they're all erupting. Um, but what, we, what, what uh, Patrick mostly found was that uh, the decay index decreases with latitude, um, which explains the higher onset heights. Um, many eruptions have a decay index of one, less than one. Um, in the kind of ideal MHD case, um, decay indexes of one or two are needed for an eruption, so maybe there's an external trigger mechanism rather than an ideal instability in those cases. Um, that's really just a suggestion. It's something we'd have to kind of look into a little bit more. Uh, another thing that we looked into is twist and writhe. So twist and writhe are defined slightly differently. Um, twist is like this eruption where there's rotation about an axis. So the axis of the flux rope is like this. And if you can look carefully, hopefully you see some rotation around the uh, axis. And then um, writhe is where you rotate the axis itself. So many eruptions had twists. Um, writhe was less common, but these are some really clear examples here. They're not all this clear. Um, so, so it might be misclassified as twist in some cases. And we looked at twist versus no twist. Um, these are, again, cumulative probability distributions. Uh, this is uh, Anderson Darling two sample tests to see if these uh, cumulative probability distributions are different. This essentially measures the difference between these two CDFs. And then the uh, probability here tells you uh, the prob probability that the, we can reject the null hypothesis, which is that these two are drawn from the same distribution. So um, the uh, onset height is a little bit different in the um, twist versus no twist. Uh, the the uh, twisted ones tend to have lower onset heights. And then the velocities of the twisted eruptions tend to be faster. And this is sort of like what you would expect from a, a kink instability. Um, the decay index and the slow rise phase really have no slow rise velocity, really have no um, statistical difference using this particular test. OK, so um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is a paper we just submitted as part of uh, AppJS um, series on solar big data. And this is primarily work done by Ashna Argawal, who is a RU student here, and Nicole uh, Skanky, who is a support scientist here. Um, they have both moved on to grad school. So we're particularly looking at filaments out of the HEK. Um, and the HEK gives us all sorts of data, metadata about these filaments. The center position, the polygon shape, uh, the bounding box, the length, the tilt with respect to the equator. Um, chirality and number of barbs are kind of geometrical properties of these filaments. Barbs is sort of these spiky things that stick out from filaments. And chirality is determined by the direction of these barbs. Um, so these guys built the the filament tracking algorithm, it records each filament instance. So when you query the HEK for this metadata, you get a whole bunch of unassociated filaments because we get data every 12 hours. But this algorithm in the HEK doesn't associate 
each filament with the solar rotation and then the next filament, next observation of the same filament. Um, so we used a tracking al algorithm um, developed by Dustin Kempton um, at Georgia State. Um, and that associates the filament instances into tracks. So this is a track um, of all the filament in instances observed at the same filament observed at different times. There was actually an eruption here, so that's why it kind of turned small. Um, so here's the filament in one of the H alpha images and then the same instance in the track here. So um, we've tied all these filament instances together into tracks. And then we associated them with eruptions. Um, eruptions are documented separately in the HEK by people, um, which means they're wildly inconsistent in terms of uh, how big people draw the bounding boxes and stuff like that, uh, where people put the, the centers. So uh, one of the criteria we used was the eruption center within a filament polygon within plus or minus 12 hours of the uh, eruption. That gave us this many um, eruption and filament track pairs, which it's not enough to do statistics on. It's like seven. Um, so then the second thing we did was uh, we had said that the filament polygon has to intersect the bounding box. Uh, within plus or minus 12 hours. So this is the bounding box of the eruption, and the near, we have to find the nearest filament that intersects that, that bounding box. And we'll call that the track that's associated with that eruption. Um, and we had to put a few limitations on it and, and uh, eventually kind of go through by eye and make sure we didn't screw up. Um, so the filament properties that we get, um, we can get area by taking the area of the polygon of the um, surrounding the, the box or surrounding the filament. We can get length that comes out of HEK, length versus width, um, kind of a, a ratio of those things. These are all related, obviously. Uh, tilt, chirality, number of barbs, latitude. Um, and because we have a track, so we have several instances of these things, we can see how these things change or as a function of time up into the eruption. Uh, so the idea was to see if any of these things changed in a suggestive way such that we could use the change in something, area, length, chirality, whatever, to uh, predict an eruption. I haven't talked about space weather. It's important. That's why we want to predict eruptions. Um, so just looking at a few of these properties, oh, I should, I should say that we did something very crude here, which is in order to get an idea of if the parameter was um, increasing or decreasing over the lifetime of the track, we fit a line to it. That's obviously not right. <laughs> this is, doesn't really look like a linear function, um, but it gives us a gross estimate of how the filament changed in length over the, the lifetime of the track. Also, the, another problem that we had with this particular data set, um, you can see some oscillation here in this parameter, which is length, I guess, um, is that the data is coming every 12 hours from two different observatories, Big Bear and Kanzel Hoi, and one of them has better resolution than the other one. I think it's Big Bear has better resolution. So, even if the filament itself doesn't change, the measurements change because there are different numbers of pixels that are visible in the uh, different resolution telescopes. So, so that's a little bit of a mess. But that's, that's just one thing we did uh, to try to get a gross idea of how the filament changes over its lifetime. Um, and then we looked at other things like the, the mean of, of the length and all these parameters, the standard deviation, that kind of stuff. OK, so here are just a couple of these parameters. Um, so this is a histogram of the non-erupting um, sample and then the erupting sample. So we, we found a bunch of uh, filament tracks that didn't erupt and put those in our non-erupting sample. And then we have our erupting sample. Uh, the blue is erupting, green is non-erupting. And over here, I have the cumulative distribution functions, where the gray is the erupting and the uh, black is the non-erupting. Um, again, we did an Anderson-Darling test. And these two were very uh, different 
look like they come from different distributions or look it's very not probable that they come from the same distribution let me say that <laughs> um, so uh, the um, and this is the the change in length as a function of time uh, and the non erupting sample um, or the erupting sample tends to have slightly uh, decreasing so the filament is decreasing uh, is more likely to be an erupting filament um, and the area came out to be kind of similar although it wasn't the p-value wasn't quite as low but you'd expect that given that area and length are correlated um, we also looked at average latitude uh, and you can see in the erupting sample there are more um, eruptions in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere um, and that comes out in the, the CDFs too. That's probably a solar cycle effect because we did um, this for 2012 and 2013. The northern hemisphere is ahead of, of the southern hemisphere in the solar cycle and in those years there were just more eruptions generally in the, the northern hemisphere. So I kind of expect that if we did this over a whole solar cycle this would kind of wash out but that's obviously a test that needs to be done. Okay, so those were our, our statistical tests. Um, we also decided to do something a little different. Um, we did a random forest classifier uh, as well, and this is my five second overview of this if you've never heard of it before. So this is a decision tree, and when you have a decision tree, you take your data, your parameters, and you make some decisions based on um, how you're going to divide up the parameters and then you end up with a, a decision at the end, a prediction as to whether or not something is red or green in this case. So is your length greater than 50 and is it a bird? Good, it's green. Is your length not 50 and it's, can't read that, uh, the eyes are not blue and it's not a carnivore, carnivore? good, it's red. So that's, that's a decision tree. If you take a bunch of decision trees and put them together, uh, you can kind of iron out some of the randomness, and that is a random forest. So we did our random forests, and uh, we put all, all, all of our metadata into the random forests. Um, this is a uh, plot showing the number of trees in the forest. Ideally, what you'd like to see here is an, uh, an increase in this F1 score, which is a measure of how well you're predicting your eruptions. So each one of these bars here is a run of a um, random forest. This one has one tree, so it's really a decision tree. Two, three, four, et cetera. And then um, you run it 10 times with different testing and training sets. Um, and the whisker, box and whisker plot shows you kind of the average um, F1 score for that ensemble. Um, and I, I mean, you know, maybe it increases a little bit with, with uh, the number of trees. It's, it's not awesome. Um, but forests of 25 trees give about a 60% uh, accuracy, 60% on this F1 score. It's better than guessing randomly, which is 49%. This is not 50% because our samples of erupting and non-erupting filaments were a little unbalanced, weren't quite the same numbers of those two features. Okay, so we used forests of 25 trees. Um, and one thing that's nice about random forests is you can get out uh, importances. So which one of your uh, features is the most important um, in making the decisions in those, all those decision trees in order to uh, decide whether or not something is erupting or non-erupting? So we took our forest of 25 trees, ran it a bunch of times, and the change in length, which is this one, is the uh, most important, almost always. Um, there are some other features here that mostly have to do with uh, geometrical you know, area, uh, the skew and the length. Um, the average latitude is in here too. Um, and this is just the, from the Anderson-Darling test, these are the um, probabilities for the, the features um, that we found. The upshot is this: is that with the random forest classifier, the random forest classifier didn't really tell us anything new over the Anderson-Darling test. 
um, we got kind of the same group of features down here and the one uh, length slope change in length was really the standout over all the rest of them. So, uh, filaments that get smaller are more likely to erupt. Um, so mass draining is a possible triggering mechanism um, because if the mass is draining out of the filament, it's going to get smaller. Uh, could also be an uh, observation bias in that maybe it's heating up such that it's uh, going out of the H alpha pass band, it's not absorbing an H alpha anymore and you're not seeing it. Um, so you have the same amount of mass, it's just heating up, that's also possible. Or maybe the filaments tend to split up before they, before they erupt is another, another possibility. So, Vinay's telling me I only have five minutes left, which is great because now I have my conclusions. So polar crown filaments have higher uh, eruption onset heights possibly due to this lower decay index. Um, eruptions with twist have faster speeds and lower onset heights. Um, that might be a kink instability at play in those eruptions. Um, twist and filament eruptions does not seem to be related to, to magnetic asymmetry. Um, and parameters such as filament length and area tend to decrease before an eruption, which might have something to do with mass draining as a trigger. That's all. Questions? Um, yeah, I, I'm sort of interested in the um, in your view on the uh, where where these filaments fit in in the sort of CME picture. Um, the, you know, is it a continuum of um, uh, of behavior or is it a subset? And sort of related to that, did you um, look into whether any of the erupting filaments have associated flares or not? And do the energies make sense in the context of CME association with flares? It's Sorry, big. that was a treble question. No, sure, that's cool. Um, I think in the filament catalog we did note, we've, we've curated a bunch of these catalogs so I start to get them confused, but yeah, we did note that if there were flares in the, uh, the catalog, the film interruption catalog, we did note if there were associated flares. Um, I don't think Patrick mentioned anything about that in his paper that I recall. I mean, you would expect the ones in the active region regions to be associated with the flares and say the polar crown filaments to not be associated with the flares. Um, I mean, I would say in terms of whether or not the, the filaments are is, is it a continuum with respect to CMEs? Sometimes if you have a filament eruption, you can have kind of a failed filament eruption where it just doesn't make it out of the, you know, lower atmosphere of the sun. So that one, that's why you get the 75%-ish number of the filament eruptions being related to CMEs. Um, can you have a CME without a filament eruption? Absolutely. Um, there are certainly cases of CMEs where there uh, is no observable low kernel source at all, uh, which is a little odd. It must be there. It's just not being observed for whatever reason. Um, so yeah, there, there, there's certainly a lot of overlap between the CMEs and the filament eruptions, but they're not always necessarily one and one, one to one. Any questions, more questions? Uh, if not, I have one. Um, so when you do the tracked filaments, uh -huh. uh, is that done manually or, or uh, automatically? In it's some done sense? automatically. Um, if I wanted to say the word Bayesian statistics, that's where I would have done it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, there is an a algorithm in that, that Dustin uses to do it, but I'm not super familiar with it, which is why I didn't go into a lot of detail there. He just hands me the results. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so in that case, uh, thanks, Kathy, again. So. And uh, Trey Winter is up next. He's also with the Solar and Stellar X ray group um, down in the Perkins. Um, so, uh, Trey, uh, do you. All right, we are ahead of time. Ta -da. All right, 
So, hello everybody, my name is Trey Winter, uh, and I'm going to be talking about a project that I started with a former RU student, uh, intern uh, here at uh, CFA uh, in 2017, uh, Caitlin Loftus, who's now going off to Harvard Graduate School, and based on her experiences with me as a solar physicist, she's going into planetary science, so <laughs> yay. Um, also, too, I'm going to be taking in the work of uh, another one of my students, also an RU student, uh, Daniel Herman, he was here in 2015, uh, but now has moved on to NIST where he's making uh, ridiculously accurate atomic clocks and he's extremely happy. So again, completely abandoning solar physics after my tutelage. All right, so I'm going to talk about some uh, vital uh, items that you need to do proper statistical analysis of data. And then I'm going to show you how we in no way uh, provided those vital items and how we're going to improve that. But if you want to do any kind of statistical analysis of data, uh, in my simple mind, you need a large data set that samples the population that you're interested in studying. Uh, you need a lack of bias in that sampling so that you're not oversampling uh, part of the distribution and undersampling another. And then you have to know which proper techniques are applicable to that type of data and to address the scientific question that you're answering. Right? So these are very basic, uh, but despite being basic, I'm really only capable of two. I am a simple country astrophysicist, and when anybody starts to bring up Bayesian analysis, I need a fistful of Bayer aspirin uh, in order to survive that conversation. So what I'm going to talk about is the large data set and how we're going to try to get rid of some of the bias in our sampling, and then I'm going to leave it to this population, this crowd, uh, to tell me what statistical techniques I need to do to uh, achieve the science that I want to achieve. So this is going to be a little bit statistics light, uh, but it's basically a cry for help. All right, so I study the sun. Uh, you've seen uh, images of the resolved sun. And the data that we're going to be talking about today comes from the Atmospheric Imaging Array, AIA, which Kathy talked about. And it images the sun in primarily uh, extreme ultraviolet light. Okay? And this is the sun in extreme ultraviolet light, and then overlaid are a series of magnetic field lines. And you can see that all these loops and structures correspond to the magnetic field lines on the sun. To tell you a little bit, to kind of um, expound on what Kathy already said about the AIA image, uh, it will take nine, usually eight, uh, sometimes nine images about every 12 seconds. So that is a lot when you're 4K by 4K. Kathy threw out the number of 1.5 terabyte of data. That's a rice compressed, so a lossless compressed data. Uh, when you actually uh, uncompress it and then add any amount of metadata or anything to it so that's actually you know kind of usable data it turns out to be three terabytes of data a day just about that uh, we're trying to analyze and the expression fr uh, drinking from the fire hose does not begin to express the enormity of the challenge of trying to adjust process that kind of data flow uh, currently, the data archive is up to about six petabytes. It's actually grown past that since I've done the calculation. So we are over the six petabyte uh, limit uh, mark. And you know, if the mission goes you know, the way we hope, we're going to get up to at least 12 petabytes uh, before we have to turn the cameras off. Um, there are a lot of technical challenges uh, concerning the storage and accessibility of that data, but it is a treasure trove of information. We have got so much information about our parent star. And the challenge for researchers now is how do you actually use that data that we've collected in the most meaningful way? And one of my fears is that uh, the data from this extremely popular and what I consider to be groundbreaking mission, a lot of it's just going to be left on the floor unanalyzed. And so it is part of my mission to try to make sure that as much of that data sees the light of publication as possible. All right, my research interest is primarily flares. And if I coordinated with Kathy better, we could have used those same models that she showed to uh, describe the filament eruptions. I could show you where the flare would probably occur during the, in the eruption model. Um, this is an, uh, a series of AIA images of the Cinco de Mayo flares. It's a, a very powerful flare eruption here on the side. We're seeing it on, in three different uh, AIA passbands. And the way you can think about this is hot, cooler, cold. So 
AIA having four different instruments uh, looking in eight different passbands. Usually there's actually some more passbands that can look at. Uh, you can think of it as looking at the temperature structure of the flare. And every time, and during all these things, you can see that as a function of temperature, things evolve slightly differently. So we can study these flares in space and time and temperature and get a lot of information from it. All right. Now, a, a lot of previous investigations of flares did statistics, but they did some of the most basic statistics that you can imagine. And what they did was they would come up with these power law relationships for everything. As we know, you, uh, power laws seem to dominate universal processes, especially if you forget the ends, which are problematic. So um, a lot of the investigations that were done previously were to uh, stack up flares uh, associated with uh, different properties. Uh, this is flux, this is fluence, and this is duration. And you just have a number of flares uh, at a given flux or get a different peak flux at a given uh, peak fluence, or I'm sorry, get different fluence of particles, and then at a different max duration time, and then you plot it. And again, ignoring these troublesome ends, right, you get these nice power laws. If you look at all flares, you get these nice power law indices of about two. And if you start breaking up all flares into different properties, like flares with the CMEs that Kathy was talking about, or flares that are not associated with CMEs, you get slightly different power law distributions. Okay? Now, one of the things I'm going to posit is that flares uh, happen at all different energies. And whereas there are fewer flares uh, at this high energy realm, right, at this higher end, um, so there are fewer in number, so the, the statistics get a little bit uh, worse, the data gets a little worse. But also, too, the statistics here at the low end are also not that great. And they're not great because they're more rare. In fact, if you, uh, you know, took this power law to its natural conclusion, there should be an infinite amount of infinitely small flares. Well, we all know the power laws break down as you get close to zero. But there are a lot, there's a lot more information in this realm right here, the lower energy flares, that is getting lost. And one of the scientific questions that we want to ask are, uh, that we want to ask is, are these sm smaller flares just different in size or are they different in kind? Is there actually some mechanism that under a specific energy threshold, you actually get an evolution that is different from what we would call a standard flare, all right? And there are several reasons why it's kind of hard to get that bottom tail of the distribution. Uh, before I go any further, I have to talk a little bit about how we classify flares. And we classify flares in this uh, very simplistic uh, regime uh, based on the amount of energy they emit uh, as seen by a, an instrument on GOES. GOES is the uh, Geosynchronous Orbit Environmental Satellites. They've been uh, observing the suns for years. I forget which one we're up on to now. Is it P, P or Q? 16 just went up. 16 just went up. So we've been launching these things for a while. There's several that are operational at a given time. And as one starts to age, another one takes concurrent observations. So there's this nice continuity of observations with the instruments. And what we're looking at here is just X-ray flux as a period, as a function of time and two of the different GOES channels. Uh, the ones that we classify, the, uh, the channel that we classify the flares with is uh, this uh, one to eight <laughs> angstrom channel. So this is X-rays. And we have just this little heuristic here of A flares being very small, B being slightly larger, C is where you're actually getting to where scientists actually get interested in flares. This is actually, you know, flare-like. Uh, M are medium flares, and then X flares are the large flares, and these are the ones that we are far more concerned with with space weather, as Kathy was talking about, geoeffective, sending off particles that might uh, affect astronauts in orbit, so we have to give them some warning time, and all of these different things. Um, this, actually, this was uh, taken during, uh, a solar, during solar max, and what you can notice is that right here is kind of the base, the basal flux, right, the background. And you can't actually determine A and B flares where they are. You can't classify them 
by emission because they are lost in the background noise of the overall background of the sun. So this is one of the challenges that we have of actually doing this kind of study with smaller flares because this was all done uh, primarily uh, with flares of uh, M and above. But you know the um, peak flux is all taken pretty much in the x-rays. And to get to these smaller flares, we really have to look at the extreme ultraviolet. Hey, we've got an instrument for that. It's called AIA. Who would have thunk? Um, and so the challenge now comes to be, how do you match up this AIA data with the GOES X-ray data in a meaningful way so that you can start working on filling out some of those tails? All right. Uh, turns out uh, it's not easy. So uh, Caitlin Loftus, when she was working here as a uh, RU student, uh, did work in looking at different types of flares and whether or not they were enclosed in what's called an emerging flux region. So this region where magnetic flux is actually pushing its way through uh, the solar photosphere, new flux is emerging, and lots of interesting and exciting things happen. And I apologize, once again, things always looking better on the computer screen than they do when projected. There are literally thousand, oh, thousands of gray tracks here. And what she did was she took um, flares and uh, took their rise time. So this is all uh, flux in that goes one to eight channel and saw how it changed and took the thousands upon thousands of tracks and then made a median track uh, for the flares. And so this is all flares that uh, she observed that were not in uh, emerging flux regions. And then these are flares that were in emerging flux regions. And then she started to combine these medium light curves, and she actually did better statistics than this. And uh, I'm sorry, this is a statistics audience. I should have shown the fancy stats, but uh, conservation of slides in a 15-minute talk prevails. And so she looked at the differences uh, between different types of flares, flares occurring in different regions, normalizing uh, these light curves showing the flux, and seeing if she could detect any differences. And this was done with M flares uh, and above. And the reason why is that we had planned, she had hoped to do it with um, flares that were under M, but it turns out it's really hard to do that with GOES with the, for the reasons I've already uh, described. And it turns out to be very challenging to try to do this type of basic curve analysis with AIA data. And the reason why is that uh, AIA data is far more complicated. When you've got these big flares that are emitting in x-rays, the sun does not emit primarily in x-rays. So the dominant thing that you are seeing is that flare, and that flare has these nice, well-defined curves. And in the decay phase, it's pretty easy to fit that to an exponential decay and get a characteristic decay time, which is something that we're very interested in. But when you look at the AIA data, this is actually a, uh, a flare that occurred at the same time. So this is AIA data that was time matched with one of those GOES curves, looking at uh, the 131 filter, which was that hotter green filter I showed earlier. And it being the hotter filter, we'd hope that there would be less noise, but then there's all this. So all of this is contained within that uh, rise time, peak, and decay of the flare. And you notice it doesn't have that nice shape. We can kind of infer that here, but then there's some other stuff that happens here. Is this, um, and so we have to do a lot more heavy lifting to deconvolve all of the different smaller events that are going on that actually contribute to this overall light curve, right? And that's a bit of a challenge. And this is work that uh, Daniel Herman did in 2014. And uh, just so that I do throw some statistics in here to show that I do know how to do some basic statistics, uh, Daniel Herman was interested, we were working together to determine if uh, flares were preheated or if all of their uh, energy came from that rapid explosion of the flare. And there's some evidence to say that some flares actually have some gradual heating before they flare. And then some others actually just undergo this rapid explosive event and all the heating comes from that. And we were trying to determine what caused one type of the flare or the other. So we just made histograms of data. Look, I know what skew, kurtosis, sigma, and mean are. And that's going to be about it. Um, 
But we were looking at which peaked first, the GOES data, the higher energy data, which would be indicative of uh, this explosive rapid heating, or AIA first, the cooler channel, showing kind of this ramp up heating before the explosion. And the results were a little inconclusive. I mean, there is some skew and ketosis. Um, the mean is shifted a little bit towards the AIA. But the data was so messy, it took him so long that his actual sample size was actually um, far smaller than what we wanted to do to do the analysis. So, yes. So, what was the uncertainty and how well you determined the peak? That's a great question. And we actually have to analyze that. Peak is not that hard. Um, if you look at these, you know, if you do. Um, yeah, you know, this, so this is actually the raw data, the blue, and then the red is kind of the smooth curve, all right? And how much you smooth the data, well, that's one of these things that we sweep very gently under our carpet and don't talk about, right? But you have to do some smoothing of the data and then find, um, you know, then you just find, you know, where uh, the second derivative goes to zero and the first derivative goes in the right way. And we can determine that pretty well uh, and you know, with those techniques, we can determine that you know within pretty much the time resolution of the telescope, which is about eight seconds. Um, but does this actually? I mean, but as you can see, there are multiple components in that. So, are we actually, you know, measuring the peak of the flare? But the flare is actually in looking at AIA data and other data sets a superposition of uh, thousands upon thousands of reconnection events. So now we have to start thinking about what we call the peak of the flare, because it's not just one thing. It's thousands of things happening nearly simultaneously. So that's a good question to which I don't have a great answer, but I can talk at length about things I don't have a good answer to. <clears throat> so. We have some data analysis cha challenges that I showed uh, previously. Um, right now, our, we've got an investigation bias towards larger flares. So not only is it harder to uh, actually see those A and B flares because uh, during solar maximum, when there's the uh, majority of bigger flares, they get drowned out by the signal. But just scientific-wise, there's an investigator bias towards the bigger flares because they're the they're the exciting flares. They're the ones that can cause things to happen here on Earth. So, you know, you don't really uh, excite your funding agency by saying, I'm looking at tiny flares that are not geo-effective at all. So there is some investigation bias towards that. And as we've seen, the data is far more complicated for the smaller flares. These uh, C flares, which are, you know, just under the M flares, you know, there is some good data sets for those. But when we're talking about A flares and B flares, these really tiny flares, there really is not uh, a great data set to sample from and that we can combine it with a whole. So this is where a lot of the work really needs to be done, these smaller flares and investigating them in a thorough way. Um, and also, too, the current, uh, Kathy showed a great database of filaments, and I can show you a similar database from the Heliophysics Knowledge Database, or Knowledge Base uh, of flares, uh, but it's not great. And I know it's not great because I made it. Um, and I owe the community uh, a few apologies. Uh, these feature detection mo uh, modules that we try to bring online to sift through this three terabytes of unprocessed data a day, uh, I got handed a module called the Flare Detective module, late in its development, uh, because the person who developed it was leaving. And I basically spent most of the time trying to figure out what he had done. It was coded amazingly well and documented, but if you've ever tried to resurrect somebody else's code, as you know, it's a huge challenge. And I got it up and working in the pipeline, and the, uh, the theory was always going to be that we got it up and running, and then uh, this was in the early days of the mission, and then we let it run for a while, and then we go back and we would do a test, because I only had a small subset of flares to test the uh, detectives effectiveness with and as we can see with all these flares there are edge cases that break it over and over again and the number of edge cases it turns out is more than the number number of well-behaved flares and what Caitlin Loftus found when she was trying to do these 
uh, timings of flares, peak time rise time, the same with Daniel Herman, is that not only are there not good enough data, but some of the data is just actually wrong if you um, investigate it deeply. And the reason for that is that the funding ran out before we could go back and do the tests. And AI and the whole SEO mission has undergone some major and drastic budget cuts since then. So how do we address these challenges? Um, and we address them the way uh, that we're addressing so many issues nowadays. We call in the robots, right? Uh, we welcome our uh, benevolent robot overlords by helping create them. And that is exactly what I'm doing. I am working uh, with uh, Caitlin on machine learning algorithms, similar to the one that Kathy, uh, Kathy's colleague used to track those tra uh, the filaments across in order to go through and sift the six petabytes of data and find every instance of a thing that looks like a flare, no matter what size or class, and uh, provide some basic parameters to it. Um, and this has got a lot of uh, efficiencies of scale. We can actually run it on almost the entire six data, uh, petabyte database almost at once. Um, you cannot do that with a you know stable of graduate students, which is the way that I was brought up in the field by just looking at data over and over again. Uh, so that's really nice, but there's some challenges to machine learning algorithms too. They're not a one size fits all and uh, type of tool. So first, you have to determine which type of algorithm do you want to use. Five minutes, great. Um, and uh, there's one called support vector machines, which. I'm a proponent of basically because I kind of understand how those works uh, work. Um, Ma Caitlin really likes the hidden uh, Markov model because that machine learning model can actually, you don't have to know all the parameters that you're testing on a priori. There can be hidden parameters that the machine uh, learning algorithm will find out in the process of its uh, going through the data. And I, so that has a lot of um, advantages, but all these machine learning models have to be trained, right? You have to have human intervention in order to train these machine learning models to go through that huge amount of data, or at least the initial few to tell the machine algorithms when they're getting things right and when they're getting things wrong. And that's what Icarus Investigations is all about. Um, Icarus Investigations is a tool to teach people how to teach machines how to find these things. It uses a framework called Zooniverse. Uh, Zooniverse is a citizen science project that allows uh, the public to interact with scientific data and to actually do science with that data uh, in very simple ways. A friend of mine is using uh, is used it to create a project called Gravity Spy, where uh, Thousands of participants go through large data sets and look for gravitational wave signals uh, within that data set. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this uh, pre-established Zooniverse framework, which has hundreds of thousands of citizen scientists participants already, to train, th uh, to train uh, hopefully thousands of volunteers uh, to detect these flares. And not only you treat this kind of like a video game, right? So you have them do this basic, okay, well, this is a flare, yay. And then once they show that they're good at that, then they level up. And once they level up, they can do new tasks like quantifying parameters on the flare or verifying some of the results that the machine learning algorithm has come up with. And lastly, and key, uh, and key to what we're trying to build with Icarus Investigations is that we're doing this for this flare project but we're trying to build a general enough framework so that if somebody was looking for a specific type of filament, right, that maybe a parameter hadn't been stored in one of Kathy's uh, databases, they can then use this uh, you know, stable of trained recruits to go through and train them, uh, machine learning algorithms to go through the six petabytes of data and pick out those specific tor types of filaments or solar tornadoes or brightenings or all these other things and try to have this trained pool uh, available for many different types of investigations. So just real quickly, I'm going to pop out of that and pop into this and show you uh, quickly how it, what it looks like. So uh, this is our Zooniverse page. Um, 
<laughs> Channel your inner Icarus. I will say that I allow Caitlin to keep the name. We all know what happened to Icarus. It doesn't, it's not that pleasant. Um, but she really loved the name, and every now and then I just don't quash the exuberance of a graduate student. I just, I let it rise, she, so I let her have it. Um, but this is what it looks like, and we can get started. I'm not going to go through a whole thing. Um, let's see, so we're going to do this one real quick. So. Uh, you get this little dialog box that we make, and we talk about uh, you know, this one is designed to pick out precisely where flares are. And so this gives you some you know, instructions on what flares are, what they should look like, and how to find them, and how to go through the entire process. And then you get to watch a little movie of a flare. And uh, this is uh, an image overlapped with a difference image and uh, just kind of shown back and forth. And the user will then pick out where they think the flare is and record it and then mark it done. So the other nice thing is that there's this whole discussion group aspect where citizen scientists can actually talk with the scientists that is doing the investigation and have a two-way conversation. And believe it or not, they want to talk to us. They want to talk to us so much and learn about what we're doing um, because they get no money or anything for this. They get this just for the joy of doing science. And again, Zooniverse has got hundreds of thousands of people working on projects like this every day. So that's just a brief overview. Um, it is planning, we're pl this is from uh, the lab. Uh, so it is still in testing and we're still refining it which is why this talk is very much um, kind of uh, the quick and dirty talk without many results. Um, and that's the wrong talk. I have multiple talks up at once. There we go. So uh, we hope to have this, the full version rolled out in uh, January. We're announcing it at the American Geophysical Union meeting in December and then probably again at the AAS meeting uh, to try to recruit people to test the data. Um, as you say, as you can tell, I've really talked lightly on the stats. So why is this on the Astro stats um, talk list? Well, one, it does, you know, involve big data. And the best way to actually go through that data is to actually use advanced statistical methods. And so what I'm trying to do is to uh, kind of bring down our data set from this six petabytes of images to some parameters that you can do some amazing statistics with. Uh, we also get a large amount of data from the testers, which I actually think would be really interesting for a bunch of research. In fact, some sociologists have already planned to do some statistical research on how non-scientists do science versus how scientists do science. So I think that's kind of a, a neat different research project as well. And I, again, I really want to provide a framework so that we can do a lot of different investigations beyond just solar flare work, my, per, my primary work. And I do believe in that these shared frameworks, we can get a, a lot more scientific bang for the amount of effort that we put in. And so with that, that's the end of my talk. I would be very happy to take any questions uh, that you might have. Thank you. So I so I just want to uh, make the point that there was a solar journal called Icarus, <laughs> which yes. I believe is defunct now. So yes, um, anyway. but no trademark overlaps. No, 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 and and also perhaps it lessens. Oh, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, questions uh, for both Kathy and Trey, if you want. What Scott. Both your data sets are highly dependent on the initial classification process, some of which seems to be uh, organically based. How do we get away from the trend of organics to want to identify the bigger and the best and the largest and generally overstate what they see? Yeah. Uh, so organically based, yeah, human based, and with all the biases that those entail. Um, Kathy, I think, showed it best when she talked about prominences and filaments, they've got different names, but they're the same physical structure. The only difference is how humans observe them. 
Um, and getting rid of that bias is a difficult question. Again, I think breaking down um, flares from, you know, this kind of Supreme Court uh, idea of, I don't know what flares are, but I know them when I see them. Uh, I'm inserting flares for another quote there. Um, and trying to get down to the base mechanisms of what causes this release of energy is the goal. But we can only do that by actually investigating the things that we call flares and getting to the meat of it. And uh, can you give the mic to Kathy? Because she's got a response to that as well. Yeah, I mean, just a more specific response to that in terms of the project that we were doing, um, the eruptions, the filament eruptions that we were looking at were catalog cataloged by people. And so that was, you know, that we found a lot of inconsistencies in how people bounded them and that kind of thing. Um, they have instituted in the HEK an automatic eruptions molecule, which molecule uh, module, mm -hmm. eh, which uh, uh, looks for fast moving, fast motions, and then catalogs that as an eruption. So that's a more consistent, I guess, uh, a, a, an attempt to be more consistent about cataloging this sort of thing. And we tried to use it, and we found that there were hundreds to thousands of, of eruptions a day. So it was it was sort of almost useless in that there was there were too many events. Um, so there you kinda need a happy medium there and we hadn't haven't figured it out with the eruptions thing yet. More questions? Sir? Um, but you brought up HEK, so uh, I had a question to both of you. Um, I mean, you know from the flare detector problems that, that you have sort of calibrated yourself that there are problems. Mm. Uh, what about all the things, other things that are the HEK? How reliable, uh, how complete can we take it to be? So the, the two things that I looked at closely were filaments and filament eruptions. Um, the, the filaments are not bad, and part of the reason they're not bad is because they're based on H-alpha data. And there was plenty of H-alpha data around before SDO, SDO doesn't have an H-alpha instrument. Um, but the filament detector was part of the um, feature finding team that was associated with SDO. Anyway, uh, there was plenty of H-alpha uh, data around to do the testing and training um, and tweaking, algorithm tweaking, and that kind of thing for the filament um, module. So the filament module is, is not bad. It's biased towards large filaments. Um, it tends to miss small filaments in active regions because uh, H-alpha can also see sunspots. And it has some thresholds to wipe out the sunspots, so it's not picking up sunspots too. Um, the other problem with it is that H-alpha is ground-based. And if it's cloudy in Kanzahoe and then it's also cloudy in California, you know, you get you miss a few days of data. And they're only taking samples every 12 hours. Um, we would really would have liked more frequent sampling, you know, making better use of the full gong network, which is all over the world. So, you know, more more samples. And it ha also had this problem that I mentioned where the um, – metadata parameters weren't consistent between the two observatories. So that's something that um, would really need some more attention, I think, on the part of the, the algorithm developers to figure out how to kind of standardize it across observatories. You know, do you treat the data differently from different observatories to get more consistent results or something like that? Um, I, that being said, I think the filament algorithm, the filament finder is one of the better ones. Um, because it had this pre-existing data set, a lot of, like Trey's Flare Detective, was looking at uh, data from wavelengths that had never been flown before, like 131 angstroms and 94 angstrom had never been flown looking at the sun. Um, and so the, there was no prior data set to, to do the, mm -hmm. the testing on, and it had to be done kind of on the fly, and then the project ran out of money, and that was the end of that. So um, I, I think it was a good, preliminary start to for these feature finding modules um, but I, I think it needs another really targeted and giant effort to, to clean them up and make them more mm -hmm. useful 
was the post testing. And, yeah, and that's the part yeah, that yeah. was really lacking. I mean, there are always edge cases to everything. And not only were some of my wavelengths not tried before, but you know, these flares are really complicated. So one of the things that we wanted to provide were measurements of the decay time. But you really have to do a lot of extra heavy lifting to sort through the data, especially when you're not dealing with one nice large flare, but you're dealing with a thousand different brightenings. Um, I think that overall the HEK, like Kev says, a good first step. It's one of these things you know, trust but verify. Um, you know, go through and you know, pull out all the events, but it's also worth it. You can make movies using Helio Viewer or some other really nice online t uh, tools. Go through and look through you know your subset of data to make sure that they meet with your intuition when you pull out events from the HEK. And as long as you're dealing with like larger features, you know, kind of gross, well understood things, you know, you're in really, you know, uh, solid ground. I mean, the flare detective is not awful. What it doesn't do very well is do start and end times very well. And I did redesign the flare detective a little bit so that it would actually uh, catch these things that look like flares but are just A class or maybe sub A class for the thought that those are flares that uh, they are of a type of what we're looking at, but they're just smaller examples of, and then that gets more confusion. So you have to know, as with all things, you have to know what question you're asking, what data you need, um, and then the HEK is the best you can do at this point. Uh, so I don't want to take anything away from the people that did a bunch of hard work on that. They did a great first stab. It's just there really does need to be this refinement step that was lacking. That's what I'm hoping that we can do with this, because citizen scientists are cheap. <laughs> this is actually being paid for primor uh, primarily out of education and public outreach money, so not scientific money. All right, so uh, let's thank uh, both speakers for this for the nice talk. <laughs> and also want to thank the high energy physics uh, seminar people for providing the pizza and the time, uh, time slot. So we'll convene again here at 2 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>